All right, uh, let's get started. So today we'll talk about uh, model evaluation and evaluation metrics. Um, maybe a couple of brief announcements. One is um, the uh, schedule says the homework will be posted today. It might just be posted tomorrow because they have to take a flight right after this. And um, oh, I recognize the second homework was pretty long. The third one will hopefully be not entirely as long. Um, it will still be pretty long probably, but um, maybe sli slightly less bad. And um, there was one, oh yeah, there is no lecture on Wednesday. So I'm gone, so uh, no lecture on Wednesday. Um, next lecture is next Monday. So today we'll talk about um, a couple of metrics for model evaluation. And um, we'll actually f we'll focus on classification, in particular binary classification. This is some of the most uh, common cases in practice. And uh, it's also one where there's like a lot of different metrics and a lot of confusion. And I think it's really important that you understand this. So a lot of the metrics for binary classification can be derived from the confusion matrix. Um, so the confusion matrix is, um, as depicted here, in the rows, you have the true classes, and in the columns, you have the predicted classes. And each entry corresponds to a count. How often was a true class, uh, was uh, class one predicted as class one? How often was it predicted as class two? How often was class two predicted as class one? How often was class two predicted as class two? Um, the two things about the confusion matrix are, uh, some people transpose it. So I think at Wikipedia right now, it's transposed to this, but it's just convention. Just make sure that you look at what the axes are labeled at. So in scikit-learn, I think it uh, has always been that uh, the rows are the true labels and the, correspond the columns correspond to predicted labels. And so uh, if you look at uh, the true labels and predictions, you can compute these four numbers, uh, true negatives, uh, true positives, false positives, false negatives. And the diagonal ones are the correct ones, the off-diagonal ones are the incorrect ones. The other thing is in binary classification, um, we often speak about the positive and the negative class. Which class is the positive and which class is the negative is a uh, convention, however. So if someone tells you, I have this and this many true positives, but they don't tell you what the class means, they're not saying anything. Um, by convention, usually the minority class is the positive class. Usually the class you're interested in is the minority. Um, and so if you do like medical diagnosis, then um, the positive class is usually like the disease exists. Um, but it's like, it's not necessarily like true for any uh, application. It's obvious which the, op the positive class is. In particular, if the person doing the analysis didn't think about which class the positive class is, everything might be mixed up. So always make sure you know uh, which class the positive class and which class the negative class uh, when you talk about any of this. So the metric that we already saw is accuracy. Accuracy is true positives plus true negatives divided by true positives plus true negatives plus false positives plus false negatives. So it's a diagonal divided by everything else or sorry, the sum of the diagonal divided by everything else. And this is what you get when you call score on a classifier in scikit-learn. Um, even though this is a default metric, it has a bunch of issues that we'll uh, discuss in a second. And I just put in a slide to remind you of what I just said, which is positive and negative are arbitrary, so make sure you understand which one is which. For accuracy, accuracy is actually symmetric in, posi in the positive and the negative class. So if you flip all p's to n's and all n's to p's, the number stays the same. That's not true for all metrics. So you can compute the confusion matrix using the confusion matrix function. 
um, from sklearned metrics. You can plot a confusion matrix using the plot confusion matrix function. The plotting functions are all relatively new. I think they're introduced in the last version. So make sure you have the newest version if you, have, if you want these. And so here I'm using the breast cancer data set. I'm splitting the data set, um, fit the logistic regression model, and then do predictions on a test set. And then I can compute the confusion matrix of, with uh, the input y test and y pred. In all the scikit learn metrics, the truth co always comes first and the prediction comes second. And so I plot the confusion matrix. I can also, sorry, I print the confusion matrix. I can also plot the confusion matrix and it looks like this. And if you plot it, it actually gives you the labels, which is good so you don't get confused with the transpose or not. All right, so problems with accuracy. So imagine we have a data set where 90% of the data are negatives, 10% are positives. So 10% of the data is the class we're interested in. Now we have three predictions, y pred 1, y pred 2, y pred 3. Each of them have 90% accuracy. Um, would you say any of these predictions is good? Yes, no, maybe. Okay, I have a couple of head shakes. So the thing is, from the number 90%, you cannot conclude that it's good. Like a random pr uh, prediction would be 90% accurate. But um, a model can be 90% accurate and still be useful. The problem is that accuracy is very non-informative when it comes to imbalanced data sets. So this data set is, uh, nine to one imbalance, which is relatively mild imbalance compared to what you can see in the real world. If you look at click prediction data, you might have one to a thousand or one to 10,000 imbalance because people never click on ads. Um, so if you look at the confusion matrix, they're actually quite different. So the first prediction always predicts the negative class. So the negative class is the majority class here. And so, um, we get 90% accurate by just always saying uh, negative. This is clearly a useful classifier, it's a constant classifier. The, the second one um, actually has, uh, predicts 20 samples as positive, 10 of them are actually positive, and 10 of them are negative. So here you can see this, this is actually probably a pretty useful classifier. It's not perfectly accurate, but um, it basically it identified all of the 10 positives that you care about, um, even though it gave a couple too many positives. But this is also 90% accurate. Um, and here, the last one, again, this has some uh, false positives and some false negatives, so it makes errors in both directions. Maybe this is not as useful as YPRED2, but uh, it's clearly more useful than just making the constant prediction of no. And all three of these confusion matrices uh, correspond to 90% um, accuracy, even though they clearly have very different characteristics. So one way to work around this would be always look at the confusion matrix. And indeed, it's a good idea to always look at the confusion matrix. However, if we want to um, compare many models, or if we want to do automatic model comparison, say we want to do a grid search. In a grid search, we wouldn't know how to compare two confusion matrices. So we want to basically boil them down to uh, a single number. And so there's a couple of metrics that people look at that are derived from the two by two confusion matrix. Arguably, the most common ones are precision, recall, and F-score. So precision is the true positives divided by the true positives plus false positives. So that says, so the denominator, the, uh, the, wait, okay, well, that, so you have the true positives, uh, which the correctly classified positives divided by everything that was classified as uh, positive in the numerator, um, in the denominator. And so this is also known as the positive predicted value. 
So that says, out of everything that was classified as positive, um, how many were actually positive? Um, the other one is recall. Recall is um, true positives divided by true positive plus false negatives. So here, it is divided by everything that actually was positive. So true positives plus false negatives are everything that had the true that was actually positive. And so what this says, out of the ones that were um, positive, how many did I actually get? So this is also known as sensitivity, coverage, or p true positive rate. I like the name coverage because it sort of conveys what it does to me, at least, in that it says, of all the positives, how many did I actually cover? One of the things that are, is important to note about these two is they are not symmetric in positives and negatives. So if you switch which, which class you call the positive class and which class you call the negative class, they change completely. So it's really, if you want to compute these, it's important that you're clear on which one is the positive and which one is the negative class. And then finally, there's the F score. There's actually um, many versions of the F score. This is the F1 score. It's the harmonic mean of precision and recall. Um, if you look at precision or recall each by itself, um, they're actually not a very good metric by themselves. You can um, make recall be perfect by always predicting positive. If you always predict positive, then recall will be one because everything will, uh, yeah. Um, if, and you can make precision high uh, by only predicting the points where you're most certain. So if you make very few positive predictions and only the ones that are, you're very certain you get a very high precision. So these two are sort of um, um, counteracting uh, each other a little bit. So um, you can easily make one big but make, by making the other one small. So precision wants you to make a few accurate predictions, uh, accurate positives, and recall wants you to find all the positives. And so um, if you want to take both of them into account, one way to do this is the uh, F1 score. So if you want to look at the single metric, F1 score might be one possible single metric that you can look at uh, if you want to do grid search for uh, in an imbalanced data set. So these three, I think at least the machine learning community, are the most commonly uh, used things that are derived from the two by two confusion matrix. There's actually a whole zoo of metrics, and there's like this pretty picture on uh, the Wikipedia page of precision recall. So this is transposed to the met to how it is in Scikit-Learn. But uh, basically, here in the here you have in the, in the uh, columns the co the uh, the true conditions and the predicted conditions in the rows, and then if you normalize them by the true conditions, you get false positive rate, recall, false negative rate, and true negative rate. And if you no um, normalize them by the predicted condition, um, you get positive predicted value or precision, false discovery rate, false emission rate, and negative predicted value. And then you can have like all of these other um, like metrics that you can uh, then further derive. So most of these metrics are not that commonly used, but I still want to show you how to compute basically all of them. So if you compute the confusion matrix um, with scikit-learn, it will just give you the counts. If you said normalize in the confusion matrix to true, it will normalize by the true condition, and so you get the true negative rate, the false positive rate, or fallout rate, the false negative rate or missed rate, and the true positive rate or recall or sensitivity. Um, so you get a matrix of these guys. If you do normalize is equal to pred, it will normalize by the predictions, and then you get the negative predicted value, the false discovery rate, the false emission rate, and precision. Um, so the, the guys we usually care about are these three, um, and I'll talk more about them in a, in a bit. 
So the, the false positive rate recall or true positive rate and um, the precision are the three that we usually care most about. This is like maybe an, um, not the best way to compute them because it's like annoying to index the matrix, but this is sort of, I think a good way to conceptualize how they um, were created out of the confusion matrix by normalizing by one condition or the other condition. If you actually wanna uh, compute them, there's a convenience function called the classification report. And uh, the classification report again gets um, the true labels and the predicted labels. So always first the true ones, the second the predicted ones. And uh, it gives you precision recall, F-score, and support. Support is just a count of samples in each class. So here I ha had this um, synthetic data set and it was 90-10 imbalanced and I had these three different confusion matrices. And for each of these, YPRED1, YPRED2, YPRED3, I ca uh, called classification report. And so maybe, um, oh, and it gives you Precision recall, F-score, and support for, for each class. Meaning, if I call this class the positive class, what will be precision, what will be recall, what will be F-score? Um, so if I look at the constant prediction, that's always negative. If the negative class is my true class, then precision is 90%, recall is one, F1 score is 0.95. If um, positive, if class, is my, well, if the class one is my positive class, precision is actually not defined. Um, recall is zero and F1 score is not defined. And so you can see that depending on which class, the positive class, there's a big difference. And you can see comparing the uh, YPRED2 and YPRED3. So the, re uh, the recall of class one of this guy here is very good. The precision is not so good because like as you can see basically if you do the column norm here the uh, precision is 50 percent if you do the row norm the recall is 100 percent um, and here um, it's sort of a little bit in between now okay if you look at so let's say the minority class is our class of interest it's the positive class as it usually is the F score here, it says zero, actually it's not defined and it gave me an error, but it shows you zero. Here it's 0.67 and here it's uh, 0.5. So you can see that this actually was, um, a, according to F1 score, this is a much better classifier than the other ones. So the one at the top is clearly completely uh, useless and this one is clearly much better than the other ones, even though they all have the same accuracy. There's also, there's a couple other metrics in here, um, which is the macro and weighted average of all the scores. And um, what this means is, so the macro average means the average over all the labels. Say I wanna compute the macro average recall, I, I compute the uh, recall for each of the labels. In this case, it's zero and one and divided by the number of labels, two in this case. Um, and so it's just the average. The weighted recall, uh, the, weight, the, average weight, the average weighted recall would be I weight each class by the number of samples in the class. Oh, there's an L missing here. Wait, no, there's not. Never mind, it's fine. So here, each, uh, each recall would be uh, weighted by the number of samples in the class. So basically the one at the top gives each class the same weight, no matter how big or small they are. Um, whereas the bottom gives more weight to the big classes. So it depends a little bit on your application, which one um, you care about more. But uh, usually I tend to use the top one because it's basically it, pre it uh, makes all the classes be similarly important. And uh, usually you particularly interested often about uh, in the small classes. And so uh, basically you don't want to downweight the small classes. If you want to compute, so we saw the classification report. If you want to 
compute just a single one of each of these, then um, there's a function for this in the metrics module as well. So here I call a recall score um, on y test and y pred one, which was the constant one. And one time I do weighted uh, average, and one time I do macro average. The weighted average is uh, 90. It's the average of 90% times one plus zero times zero. And uh, the macro average is 50% uh, times one plus 50% times zero, so it's 0.5. Um, I actually quite like this uh, macro average recall. One of the nice things about it is it's always 0.5 if, if you do chance performance. If you do a constant prediction or basically if you predict uh, randomly, then uh, macro average recall will always be 0.5. That's not true for accuracy. Accuracy, um, as we saw, can give you like the same value for very different um, results. There's actually a different name for this uh, macro average uh, recall. It's also known as balanced accuracy, though there's, um, yeah. Some people use a different definition of balanced accuracy. I think this is the most common definition of balanced accuracy, but usually I just say macro average recall because it's unambiguous. Um, but I, I think they sh basically they should be the same. In scikit-learn, they're the same. Um, yeah, and this is just basically the, the average of the recall for the two classes, uh, which you can also express in terms of the confusion matrix. Um, so it's one half, uh, yeah, okay, I'm not gonna. Basically it's uh, recall and then recall but with the negative, for the negative class. And um, if the data set is balanced, it's actually the same as accuracy, which is called why it's, ba why it's called balanced accuracy. Yeah, so this is kind of nice because um, you know what 0.5 means. All right, so I want to give a little bit of, of a real example, which is the mammography data set. And uh, this is trying to detect uh, calcium deposits in mammography uh, data. Uh, we have, yeah, you can lo load it from OpenML. We have uh, about 11,000 data points, uh, six features. And um, basically, most of the 11,000 are minus one, and 260 are plus one. So this is a pretty imbalanced data set. Um, so the labels here are actually string labels. You can't see that because pandas doesn't show it directly. But um, so the minus one and the one are strings. Um, Scikit-learn in a couple of places has some like, maybe not super beautiful, but useful heuristics that tells you which class it assumes is positive. Um, it doesn't know about strings. So if I wanna say uh, the easiest way to tell scikit-learn that the class that is the string one is the positive class is saying y equal equal string one. Now, y, now whatever y train and y test are now a uh, Boolean vector and true is the positive class and false is the negative class and scikit-learn knows which one I mean as the positive class and which one is the negative class. Another option would be every time I call a metric I can tell scikit-learn which one is the positive class but that's much more annoying than basically con converting it to true and false. Um, this goes obviously with the caveat that if your data is true and false it will assume true is the positive class. And that might not be useful for your data set. All right. So let's uh, look at some of these metrics. So here I'm using a pipeline of a standard scalar and SVC. I tuned the parameters already so that I get like a pretty good result. And I have a random forest classifier that I just used with the defaults and it's like slightly better. But both of them are 
and 98.9% accurate. So they're very close. So chance performance on this data set uh, would be 97% accuracy. If I want to look this, into this a little bit more detail, I can do um, the classification report <coughs> between um, Y test and the predictions. And then you can um, already see some differences. I mean, so here for the, the um, false class, which is the big class, the numbers are basically the same. Um, you can see that for the true class, the precision is much higher for the random forest, and the recall is a little bit higher for the random forest as well, and so the F-score is higher for the random forest. So, I mean, here it's much more clear what the, the, the difference in the metrics means. So if I, uh, if I look at the precision of 0.9 where the precision of 0.81, I can, um, I feel like I can give a more intuitive explanation of what that means. You can also see, yeah, the, the um, macro average recall or macro average precision uh, and macro average F1 score, they also all basically distinguish the two classifiers, whereas the weighted average, uh, I guess here, this, this one distinguishes it. But basically the weighted average is not really that useful here. But yeah, so maybe I should say this again. If you just look at uh, the recall of one class, that um, by itself is not a good metric to do grid search. But if you look at the macro average recall of both classes, then that's a good metric that uh, captures everything. You could also use uh, macro average precision, but it's, it's not that commonly used. All right, so this is sort of the basic metrics for binary classification. For a minute, I want to do a step back and um, come back to what we discussed in the very first lecture, which is uh, goal setting. You should really think about, in your application, what is it that I want, and how can I measure what I want? The best thing probably to do is assign costs to the confusion matrix. If you can assign costs to each of the entries of the confusion matrix, then you can use some decision theory. Uh, I'm not going to go into the details, but you, it's relatively straightforward. You can um, find what is the optimum decisions to make um, given these costs. Another thing that uh, you could think about is guarantees you want to give. Say, um, maybe your boss tells you, um, I want 99% recall, after you explain to them what recall is. Um, but the recall and precision are something that is like, um, relatively easy to comprehend, and you can say, I give the guarantee that um, if I say 100 frauds, I will fi uh, find 99% uh, of the fraud that is committed. And that might be a useful metric to provide to someone. And so in this case, I mean, maybe you can measure what the actual outcome of actions is. So measuring what is the actual outcome of actions is, um, basically the best, but um, if not, you can think about what are the things that I really want to guarantee. So, now let's, let's say we have uh, thought about what we care about. Um, let's say we do like credit card fraud, and um, I guess what companies tend to do is they block a bunch of fraudulent transactions and uh, so they have, they don't want fraudulent transactions to go through, so they have very high recall, but they don't have that high precision because whenever I travel abroad, they block my credit card, unless I tell them. Um, so maybe they decided, okay, I want to ha we want to have very high recall and we don't care about precision that much because we really want to protect our, um, our customers. Um, so what can we do then? So one very simple thing is that most models provide you with some um, measure of uncertainty. So if, if we use um, the predict method, basically the model make, makes a decision and it gives you one of the classes. 
but usually the model has some internal uncertainty about the classes that you can get at. This can be um, for models in scikit-learn, either with predict proba or with decision function. So I mentioned this when we talked about the decision trees. Um, the probabilities are not like not trustworthy probabilities. If the uh, if the tree says I am 90% certain that this and this that this class won, you shouldn't be 90% certain. A tree is always like telling you something too certain, but you can still use that to change your decisions. So let's say, um, I guess in this example, I really, I, yeah, I wanted to increase my recall. And so I had a recall of 0.56. And so now I'm looking at the probability of the positive class. So this is brick proba x test will give you an umpire array of shape, um, number of samples times number of classes. So I now have the probability for class zero and class one or class two, and, sorry, class false and class true. And so then I take the probability of class true. And so I define a new prediction, y pred. I can say, um, I want to predict class true whenever the probability of class true is greater than 30%. So by default, the threshold for probabilities in binary classification is 50%. So basically, predict will always give you the class that has higher than 50% uh, probability. But you can change the threshold in this way that I just did. Now, I um, have a higher recall for uh, the true class. I get a, a slightly lower recall for uh, the other class. So I get a higher recall, but a lower precision. So basically, there's a trade-off between um, the recall and the precision I get based on the threshold I'm using. So here, I changing the threshold, I basically said I care more about recall. Um, after I changed it this way, actually the, the F1 score went down, um, basically it's, which says maybe the loss in, re in precision wasn't worse the gain in recall if you do the um, harm, uh, harmonic mean, but uh, the uh, macro average recall or balanced accuracy actually went up, which I found a little bit surprising. Um, all right, so so now let's say we care more about um, recall and precision, but we don't know how to set the threshold correctly. You should look at what is called the precision recall curve. The precision recall curve looks basically at all possible thresholds. It looks at all probabilities that were predicted on uh, your data set and tells you what is the precision and recall if I threshold it as this value. And so each value, uh, each uh, point on um, the graph basically corresponds to one threshold, so one model that we could use in, like, to make our decisions. And so basically, I gave it um, my, a support vector machine, so it just has this one support vector machine model, but by using different thresholds, I can do all of these different th trade-offs. And um, the trade-off I get by default, if I call predict, is this guy. Um, I made a circle around it. So. If I just call predict and I compute precision and recall, this is what I get. This point is not really that special. And uh, actually, um, like usually the, the best possible curve would be going to the top right corner, which says I have a precision of, I can achieve a precision of one while also getting a, pre a recall of one. That would be the perfect classifier. So the closer you are to the top right, the better in a sense. And so, um, so maybe you would think this is uh, the point here is maybe a better uh, trade-off between uh, recall and precision. But it depends a little bit on what you want. So again, you can think about what are the guarantees I want to give and what is the trade-off that I'm willing to make. And so, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure I don't want to do this here because it makes the precision like super bad. Um, so probably I want to figure out something over here. But um, basically, it's up to me to figure out um, what is the threshold I want to use. 
Uh, oh yeah, slight side note. So uh, about the um, uh, plotting functions in scikit-learn, as I said, they're relatively new. Um, hopefully they're useful. Um, so the way the plotting works in scikit-learn, at least for the model, oh yeah. The point is the so okay ah so th there is systematic ways um, though they are not implemented in scikit learn so but there's also um, basically one common way is to figure out what, uh, like the point that has closest Euclidean distance to the top right corner is one heuristic that people use oh, I don't want to say something. You know, that's, that should be the one that maximizes the F1 score, actually. Or is that in the precision recall gain curve? Okay, I would have to double check that, but I, I think I'm, uh, that might be the one that maximizes the F1 score. Um, but yeah, but it depends on what you want to maximize. Because as I said here, uh, I have two different thresholds, and if I look at this metric, then, this, then the bottom one is better. If I look at the other metric, the top one is better. So basically, there's no one way. And um, okay. so that's that's a little bit tricky, right? <laughs> Which is why I, th I said it's uh, good to think about guarantees that we want to give. Uh, are there any classifiers where you cannot change the threshold? Are there classifiers where you cannot change, uh, change the threshold? I don't think so. Um, they all have predict proba or decision function. In some of them, it's less useful. Um, if you have a KNN classifier with K equal to, so a KNN classifier will use the voting as an uncertainty. So if you have K equal to three, there's only three possible values. There's 33% uh, likely, 66% likely, and 100% likely, and zero. Well, is that, is that three? Yes, okay, never mind. There's four possibilities, yeah. Good question. Wait, wait until another slide, okay? Um, oh, three slides, sorry. Okay, I want to very briefly talk about the plotting. So the, what the plotting does is, so there's a precision recall curve function in scikit-learn that doesn't do the plotting, and there's one that's plot precision recall curve that does the plotting, similar to the confusion matrix. I think you usually you just want to look at the precision recall curve, so I would usually call the plot one. And what it gets is uh, the model, so in this case, I have a support vector machine, the test data, and the uh, test labels. And I can give it a name. So usually it would take the name from the estimator. This SVC is actually a pipeline because it has a standard scalar in it. And so I name it SVC because I don't want it to be called pipeline. If I call this precision recall curve thing, the, the plot pops up, which is great. Um, I also get back this guy, which is, uh, Precision recall display, and this precision recall display has stored all the uh, um, computations it did. The computation of the precision recall curve is not that expensive, but like there's other plots that are very expensive, like the permutation importance and partial dependence, which we'll come to. But basically, you don't want to compute something twice, even if it's not that expensive. And so you have the precision and the recall for each of the thresholds and um, then some stuff from the plot, basically. And once you computed this, you can call, uh, plot again, and you can put, plot it as many times as you want from this object that you got. And so we'll, we'll use that a bit later. But yeah, so for every plot in scikit-learn, it will return a display object. The display object will contain all the computation. So for the plot confusion matrix, it will contain the confusion matrix. And then you can call plot on it anytime you want, and you can plot it again, like in a new graph or something. There's another curve that I want to look at before I explain what AP and AUC mean, um, which is the ROC curve. The ROC cur uh, or ROC curve stands for uh, receiver operating characteristic, which no one ever says, and everybody always says ROC curve. Um, this shows the true positive rate versus the false positive rate. 
the true positive rate is the same as recall. So the y-axis of this is the same as the x-axis of the other plot. But here we have the false positive rate instead of precision. Um, this curve usually looks a little bit smoother, but uh, I think in, I find that in imbalance classification, it's somewhat harder to interpret. Um, so looking at the two of these, yeah, as I said, they're, um, they share one axis, but they're transposed. Actually, so you can, for each threshold, you can compute the confusion matrix, and the confusion matrix corresponds to both the point on the left and to the right. So if, if I get one curve, I can actually compute the other curve. So they map one to one, but they have different shapes. Um, yeah, so this at the recall axis here is the same as this axis, but the other axis, it's just scaled differently. And so I would argue that the precision recall curve gives uh, more weight to the um, positive class of the positive class in the min minority. Whereas um, in the rock curve, it's a little bit harder to see that. One thing that's quite important, and which is the reason that some people like the rock curve better, is interpolation is meaningful on the rock curve, but not on the precision recall curve. If you look at the rock curve, it's maybe a little bit hard to see, but some of the lines are like slanted. Actually, in the rock curve, you can look at the convex hull of the rock curve, and you can build a classifier for any point of the convex hull. So maybe if I look, if I want to have a classifier that sits over here, which would actually be probably a pretty good classifier, what I could do is I could do the classifier corresponds to this threshold, and the classifier corresponds to this threshold, and then I can do... Um, basically um, an average of these two. Or I think in theory, what you have to do is you, you flip a coin uh, depending on where on, on the line you, that connects them you want to be. So basically if I want this point, I flip a coin and with probability 0.5, I uh, take the classifier that corresponds to this threshold and with, with probability 0.5, I take the classifier that corresponds to this threshold and then I get a classifier and the classifier is over here. And this means basically I can, I can look at the convex hull because linear combinations in this space actually corresponds to classifiers that I can easily achieve given the classifiers I'm given. For the guy on the left-hand side, for a precision recall curve, that's not true. So I cannot achieve any of the classifiers over here. Or even, you can see that it goes like a little bit down and up again. I cannot achieve any of the classifiers or not directly. Um, so some people use interpolation of the precision recall curve. People in computer vision really like to do that. Um, but it doesn't really make sense. Um, because they don't, the points on, the, if you connect two lines, uh, two points with a line, the points on this line don't correspond to actual data points. Uh, sorry, to actual models that you can build. Anyway, so there, so I'll, I think uh, from now on, I'll focus a little bit more on the uh, PR curve um, because today I like it better. Um, oh yeah, so if I want to plot them for multiple classifiers in the same plot, so by default, uh, plot precision recall curve will create a new plot for each classifier. And um, if I want to plot it in the same plot, I can just pass x equal to plt.gca which means plot in the current axis, which will put it in the same axis that already exists. This is similar to like, you can often do this in pandas also. <coughs> you can basically pass an axis that you want to plot into. And if you pass the axis that is the current axis, it will just plot over whatever you plotted before. If I already computed the PR SVC before, I could just compute, call the plot function instead of computing it again. But for sort of, for making the slide self-contained, I computed it again. Yeah? Um, you said that in the PR code, the points do not, like, while interpolating, the points do not belong to a particular model or classifier, right? Yes. How does it belong in the case of ROP as well? 
Well, in RC, basically, I mean, as I said, you, you can make up a classifier. Like, if you do look at uh, two points and you do line connecting them, so basically, you do, um, as I said, if you want to point in the middle, that's 0.5 times uh, one plus 0.5 times the other, you flip a coin and 50% of the time you pick this one to make a prediction, 50% you pick this one to make a prediction. And so basically, you can get any point by tossing a biased coin that says, um, X percent of the time I'll use this, and X percent of the time I'll use this. And, this, and if you actually use this classifier, then you can work out the math that this will actually have the precision and recall that correspond to the point on the line. So kind of logic of the part you see in the CR code. Yes, but it doesn't map to the uh, doesn't map to a line. And I'll reference the, the link to the uh, paper that ex explains it uh, is in two slides. Um, Basically, because they have different numerators, you can't you can't do that. Uh, precision recall have different numerators, uh, denominators. Why do I confuse these today? Uh, denominators. While true positive rate and false positive rate have the same uh, denominators. All right. So again, uh, again, this is now a very very fine grained um, explanation of the model with all the possible thresholds. This is great to look at. You should definitely look at it. If you want to compare models in grid search again or in any automated way, or you have tens of models, you can't easily compare these curves. So in this case here, maybe, OK, if the, the orange curve is basically always be, uh, above the blue one, maybe you can say, OK, the orange is better. But very often, they cross, and then it's hard to say which one is better. One way to summarize these uh, is, um, Two metrics called average precision and um, area under the rock curve. Average precision is sort of like the area under the average under the precision recall curve if you approximate it with a lower step function. Basically, this is the definition. Um, you enumerate all the all the threshold uh, the thresholds, and you um, basically compute precision times the change in recall from one step to the next, uh, from one threshold to the next threshold. And um, basically the way we plotted these guys here, it's basically the, the area under the thing that we plotted because we plotted it with like um, a left step function. And so this gives you a single number that summarizes um, the whole curve. One thing that you should keep in mind if you do this is now you look at all possible thresholds. And if you need to make a decision, this will not tell you anything. This doesn't help you pick a threshold. This will not help you make a decision. It tells you, on average, over all possible precision values, one classifier is better than another classifier. Also, good luck to ex explaining this to anyone on the business side. A uh, related metric for the, area, uh, for the ROC curve is the area under the ROC curve. Um, often this is just called AUC. AUC stands for area under the curve. I think it's like in scikit-learn it's called rock AUC to be explicit. This is the area under the rock curve. And um, because, because this uh, on the rock curve basically you can go under the convex hull, um, I mean, we, we actually don't use the, the convex hull uh, thing. I guess we could, but um, we basically do um, a trapezoid rule integration of, so basically you connect all two neighboring points with a line. And um, yeah, so this is basically the shaded area here is what we're computing. And um, so here AUC in the plot is, uh, the area under the curve, which is 0.82. So both of these numbers are always between zero and one. So if you had for the rock curve, the optimum is in the top left. If you are in the top left corner, I mean, this, this is like, then the integral would uh, be one because you integrate a constant one from zero to one. Um, 
One thing that's nice about the area under the rock curve is that it's 0.5 for random or constant predictions. So um, basically, if you have a constant prediction, then this thing is a diagonal line, or if you make a random prediction, this guy is a di diagonal line that goes basically from 0, 0 to 1, 1. And um, so you get an area of 0.5. So I like this because similar with the uh, macro average recall, you have a baseline and the baseline works no matter how imbalanced uh, the data set is. Whereas for the average precision, the baseline depends on the class imbalance. And so it's not as obvious to say whether something is better than chance or not. And so I just want to briefly illustrate the difference in like using a rent ranking metric and uh, using a metric based on the predictions. So here I use, um, the I get the decision function. And so usually the threshold is zero. So if I ask, is the decision function bigger than zero, this will give me the same as predict, right? So here, the decision function equal, uh, greater than zero is predict. Now, if I take the F1 score of decision function equal to um, greater than zero, I get some value. And if I take average precision uh, score of the decision function, I also get some value. They're actually quite similar. OK, so now let's say I take this decision function and I shift it, um, say, I subtract minus 10. What will happen to these two numbers? If I subtract whoo, minus 10, and then I ask afterwards, is it greater than 0, it's probably never going to be greater than 0. And so I have a constant prediction, and the F1 score is 0. The average precision score goes over all possible thresholds. So it doesn't, even, doesn't care where the threshold is. And so the uh, average precision score doesn't change. So basically, if you look at say, a linear classifier, and you have a hyperplane that um, separates your points perfectly, to average precision, it doesn't matter whether the hyperplane actually separates the points or whether the hyperplane is way off, but it points in the right direction. Actually, let, let me draw this real quick. I didn't have time to draw this on the slide, unfortunately. So let's say I have this classifier, and then yeah, this, is, this is supposed to be the same data set. I have this classifier. These two classifiers have the same average prediction, uh, average precision, assuming I draw it correctly. So assume we just shifted the boundary. This looks great. This looks bad. Average precision doesn't care. Just um, basically. It, do, it doesn't take care of picking the threshold because it is independent of the threshold. All right. So here are a couple of the metrics that we talked about. Um, yeah. Oh, maybe, yeah. So if you have the... the like the F1 score and the balanced accuracy score, these work on predictions. So these are already threshold of decisions. Whereas um, the average precision score and the rock AUC, they work on uncertainties. And so if you want to compute them directly here, um, the F1 score gets Y test and then the prediction, whereas the average precision score gets white test and the probability of the positive class. Uh, if you have probabilities or if you have a decision function, it just gets the decision function. And the same for the rock score. A very common mistake is passing the prediction to average precision score or rock AOC. If you pass the prediction, 
you already thresholded it and it will not give you the correct result. And you're basically computing a wrong number. Please don't do that and publish a NIPS paper as other people do. Um, New RIPs, sorry. Um, yeah, there's two papers that I quite like and they're fun to read if you really care about uh, binary decision thresholds, which apparently I do. Um, one is called the relationship between precision recall and rock curve. It tells you about how to map a uh, rock curve to a precision recall curve and how they're sort of equivalent, but how you cannot do interpolation on precision recall curves. And the precision recall gain curves is um, how to change precision recall curves so that you can do interpolation again and everything is nice. But no one you so but the bottom paper has like I think I checked earlier it has like less than 100 citations so they did something that's really nice I think but no one uses it so whatever um, or maybe I didn't look at the right citation I think people should use it um, okay yeah okay I already said all of this so um, basically these are probably the four metrics that I would use uh, would use a one score balanced accuracy average precision or uh, rock AOC. I probably um, favor these days average precision over rock AOC, even though it might be a little bit harder to interpret. Um, yeah, basically, if you have an imbalanced data set, don't use accuracy. Please, please, oh dear God, don't use accuracy. Cool. So, the next thing I want to talk about. And let's see how, how far we get with this. Um, is multi class classification. And so the things that basically say the same are the confusion matrix and the classification report. Basically, what I showed you were sort of were already multi class variants, only for two classes. So I can just call, so this is a 10 class classification data set of uh, handwritten digits. The cycle learn digits data set is like a very uh, teeny data set and um, so if you call the confusion matrix you get a 10 by 10 matrix that says um, for each true class how often was it predicted as these positive as these other class and so for example um, class 8 I should have really called plot precision uh, plot confusion matrix so class 8 is often taken to be class 2 Wait, no, class one, sorry. It's class zero, class one. So class eight is often confused with class one. That's the most common mistake in this data set. And so, again, this is like nice and pretty fine-grained way to look at it. Definitely look at it. Uh, it might be a lot of numbers to look at if you have very many classes. If you have very many classes, evaluation will always be a little bit annoying because it's very hard to say what are the classes you care about if you have 20 classes, I, uh, I have a hard time thinking about it. Um, if you can assign costs to all the possible misclassifications, that would be nice. Um, or maybe you can assign a cost by a row or a column in this matrix. But yeah, generally I find it quite, quite tricky to think about this. Um, you can look at precision recall and F-score for each of the classes, or you can look at the uh, Micro average or weighted, the macro average or weighted average. In this case, everything is 96 for some reason. Oh, who knows what the reason is? Can anyone tell me? The data set is balanced. The data set is balanced, all of these are the same. Uh, actually, I'm not sure if F1, no. Uh, I'm not sure if the macro average of one is the same. But basically, if, they're, if the data set is balanced, weighted and macro average are the same, and ma macro average recall is the same as um, accuracy if the data set is balanced. So it makes sense that everything is the same if your data set is balanced. And then these are not that, not that useful. All right. Um, yeah? So I, 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 the, the labels are zero to nine. 
in both rows and columns. And so this row corresponds to, I hope I haven't transposed it in my mind, but this should correspond to the true condition class H. So this row corresponds to all the samples that were classified, no, sorry, that are actually class H. This number here says, of the one that are class H, 43 were uh, classified as class H. And zero were classified as class zero, three were classified as class one, two were classified as class two, three, four, and so on. So basically, I, I know the row and column labels are zero to nine. And um, then this gives me the counts. But yeah, if you do the plot confusion matrix, it labels it nicely for you, and um, that would be nicer. Okay, so this is basically the same as we saw before. What's a little bit more tricky is um, looking at the other metrics, uh, average precision and uh, rock AOC. Every time I, I, I do this, I, I say, oh, I really should have, if anyone did uh, multi-class average precision, I haven't really seen anyone do multi-class average precision. But people do use multi-class rock AOC. This is oh, this has actually been merged. Um, so conveniently, there's four versions and no um, consensus on which one to use. <coughs> so I think yeah, when I wasn't here, when Thomas was lecturing, you were we're talking about uh, one versus rest and one versus one uh, reductions of multi-class problems. And so basically, the rock AOC is a binary metric, and you can again again do the multi the these two reductions. So you can either say for each pair of classes, I compute the AOC, or I can do I compute the AOC for one class against all the other classes. And so the one at the top is for each pair of classes, and the bottom is one versus all the other classes. And then you can also do either um, weight by the size of the class or don't weight by the size of the class. And so there's four options, uh, one versus rest or one versus all, and uh, weighting or non-weighting. There's only two papers that describe these, these two, um, but you can do, like, there's no reason why you couldn't do the other four. There's papers describing all four of them. Um, it's, yeah, I don't think there's really consensus I would probably use the one versus rest unweighted one. Oh, and the top one only works if you have probabilities because otherwise um, you can't really compare two classes. Um, so the, the top one only works for probabilities. The bottom one works for any kind of um, uncertainties. And so I would probably use the bottom one, uh, but without the weighting. Okay, yeah, so again, so you have the threshold-based ones, accuracy, precision, recall, F1, macro average, and weighted. Um, so there, there is, I mean, obviously there's no precision or recall. So for binary classification, if you define a positive class, you have a precision and a recall. For uh, multi-class classification, for each class you have precision and recall. So these are not single numbers. If you want a single number, you can do a macro average. And so the only single numbers we have really are accuracy, which is terrible for imbalanced data sets, and uh, macro average precision recall on F1, or macro averaged um, rock AOC, or one versus one rock AOC. So we have a little bit less options here, um, but maybe still too many. I guess the, the main question again is like, do you want something that is threshold independent or threshold dependent? Usually I guess um, when, I, um, when I search for parameters, I use threshold independent ones because I think, oh, I can always tune the threshold afterwards. So I would usually use um, average precision for um, doing grid search and binary classification problems. Um, 
Yeah, for multi-class, I will either use macro average recall, macro average F1, or um, the AOC. So we didn't have multi-class AOC last time I tried to do a multi-class grid search, but now we do. Um, so I probably would use that. We have 10 minutes, and so I'm like, I might actually, should I skip the regression part? I have 15 more slides, probably not gonna work. I'm gonna tell you about regression later. No, okay, I'm gonna do it. I'm just gonna, it's, there's not that much information anyway. Um, so very briefly talking about reg uh, regression models, and then I wanna talk about the, a little bit more about the scikit-learn API. Um, so actually I'm like, I have spent much less time with regression and with classification, so this is maybe one of the reasons why the section is shorter. So the built-in metrics for uh, scikit-learn, um, R square is the um, default. Um, the, it's the benefit of R square is it's sort of easy to understand the scale. Zero means random, one means perfect. Um, the downside of R square and also MSE is that it depends a lot on the scale, um, and it's also very um, sensitive to outliers, as you might have seen in the homework. You can, there's also a mean absolute error, median absolute error uh, in scikit-learn. Um, they are more robust. So if you do um, absolute error, uses the absolute values instead of the square norms. And so that's more robust against outliers. If you, if you compute uh, the median instead of the mean, then it's even more robust to outliers. But you might be very bad on some points if you look at the median, and you're not gonna see that. With M MSE and R square, if you're very bad on some points, your score will suffer a lot. Um, another one that I see a lot in industry is uh, MAPE, which stands for Mean Average Percentage Error. Um, this basically allows your, so this looks, says, we look at the relation of the error to the ground truth. So basically, if the value was very big, then making a very big mistake doesn't matter so much. If the value was very small, I shouldn't do a, a big mistake. And so here, if you look at, um, let's say you have the, the orange part, so on the x-axis, I have a feature. On the y-axis, um, I have two predictions, uh, or sorry, I have the truth in blue and the prediction in, in uh, orange. And so here, this distance here between these two points is a MAPE of 12, or as a MAPE of 12. Basically, this is a 12% error in prediction, whereas this mistake here is a 40% error in prediction, according to MAPE. You can see that this bar is smaller than this bar, but it has a higher error because it MAPE counts relative errors. And so some people in like sales applications like to use this. Um, some people really like it, some people really dislike it. Um, think about what it means. Oh my gosh. So I was doing a gamble today and, today and see if my uh, laptop can do a lecture without battery. Guess what the answer is. Um, yeah, so this was basically the only thing I really wanted to say about metrics. I mean, there's a lot more to say. Um, for debugging models, things that uh, are also useful um, is predictions plots, where you uh, plot the predicted versus the true target. Um, and then if you have something like this, you can see there's a systematic error that things that have a uh, very high target were underpredicted. Um, you can there's also you can look at residual plots. Residual plots. This is the same as this, but basically uh, tilted by 45 degrees. So this is uh, the true target versus uh, true minus predicted, and you can see that basically, if um, if the true value was small in this case, we're underpredicting. So meaning prediction is too low, we're, um, 
sorry. True minus predicted. Actually, we, we are over predicting. And if the uh, true value is large, we are under predicting. It's also useful maybe to, um, to look at uh, counts of the residuals and so on. Um, So now I wanted to, in the last five minutes, talk about uh, using the, all these different metrics with scikit-learn. So basically, uh, the way I showed it so far, uh, we used the metric functions that were called like accuracy score or um, balanced accuracy score or rock AOC score and so on. Uh, but you can also use these in cross-validation grid search, obviously. The easiest way to use them in cross-validation or grid search is to um, set scoring equal to a string. And so if I uh, don't do that, it will use the default scoring, which is accuracy for classification and R square for regression. I can also give a string and say, for example, in this case, scoring is accuracy, and it will compute accuracy, which was already the default, so I get the same results. Or I can use a different me uh, metric, say average precision, and now I get average precision. Um, yeah, you need to make need to be a little bit careful about which one is the positive class here. But um, so second learn tries to automatically infer the positive class. Just make sure it did it correctly. You can also like here. Basically, I did cross validation three times. So I built uh, 15 models to compute three metrics. I can also compute multiple metrics at once um, with the cross-validate function. So cross-validate, um, I think I mentioned this in, when we talked about cross-validation. Cross-validate allows you to use multiple metrics, and it returns a dictionary. So similar to cross val score, I give it um, my model data x targets y, and then as scoring, I give it a list of metrics. In this case, accuracy, average precision, recall macro, and I say return train score equal to true. And now it gives me rest. The rest is a dictionary. I, I make it into a data frame because it's nicer. And so you can see that um, for each of the five repetitions in the cross-validation, I get the fit time, the score time, the test accuracy, the train accuracy, the test average precision, the train average precision, and so on. So this way, I can compute many different metrics without having to do cross-validation again. Um, for these strings, there's a bunch of built-in scores. You can either um, look at the documentation, or you can um, import scores. I'm like, is this even still public? I, okay, I need to check if this is still public, but yeah. But somewhere there's a scores dictionary. It might be in just in sklearned metrics now. Um, and this show, shows you all of the different metrics. Some of them are classification, some of them are regression, some of them are clustering. And you can just pass these as a string and you'll get the metric. Um, so if you use a string, what you're using implicitly is what we call the scorer interface. The scorer interface is basically how scoring works in cross-validation in scikit-learn. So as I mentioned before, if you, if you use the metric functions, like average precision score and balanced accuracy score, you need to know what to pass it. You need to know whether it takes probabilities or whether it takes predictions. And as I said, that's like a very common mistake in passing it the wrong thing. And so that to make sure that um, cross-validation does the right thing, basically in cross-validation we use a different interface. And this interface is um, the score interface, which takes the model, the test data, and the test labels. And then it computes internally whatever it needs to compute from the model and computes the correct uh, prediction. So here, basically, the interface is the same for average precision and balanced accuracy. Uh, if you use the score interface, if you use the metric function interface, you need to make sure to compute the correct thing. 
Usually you don't have to worry about this too much. If you provide a string, it just happens under the hood and you don't need to worry about it. But if you want to create um, your own callable or your own metric, it's something you do need to worry about. And um, so if you want to implement one point, you have to adhere to this interface. And so I can uh, define a callable that gets an estimator, um, basically y, uh, x test and y test. The model was already trained during cross-validation. Now you want to evaluate it. And so um, if you want to re-implement accuracy, it would look like this. So if I define a function like this, I could pass it as scoring in cross-validation or grid search and it would work. And you can replace this now by, by uh, any other metric you want to compute. I actually used this when I made the slides for the talk on the regression. Um, when we talked about the lasso, I had this uh, plot here that also shows the number of non-zero elements. And so to do this, I, divide, uh, I created a new uh, metric. The metric was number of non-zero coefficients. The nice thing about the score interface is it's super generic and you get the model. So basically the, my metric that I call it non-zero is just the number of the, sum of the non-zero um, uh, coefficients. And now in my grid search, I set scoring to be a dictionary. So before we saw it can be um, a single string, it can be a single callable, it can be a dict, and it can also, and it can be a list. It's great. Um, so if you define one yourself, you, uh, you, you, um, and you want to use multiple metrics, you need to uh, use a dictionary. And so basically what I'm saying is, I want to record the R square. Sorry, I, I want to have something that is called R square, and it should be computed using the R square score. And I want to compute something that I'm gonna call num non zeros, and it's gonna be used, uh, computed using this function I defined. Now, since this is grid search, I also need to tell it how, how should it select a mo the model that it'll refit. Because um, now I have two metrics, and so um, I need to tell it which one to use to select the best model. And I say refit equal to R2, which is the key in the dictionary here, um, saying I want to compute, uh, I want to refit the model with the lowest R square. And then if I look at, oh, I left out the one line that, so results as grid, uh, grid.cv results. And this now has like as keys, all the metrics for the training and the test set. Um, so the number on zeros is obviously the same for training and test set because it's independent of the data. But now I can make this beautiful plot that I showed you earlier. All right, uh, questions? Then uh, see you next week.